episode of The World Beyond Belief. This is a very special episode because we welcome back a good friend to our show, Oli Damagard. Now, if you don't know Oli, he's an incredible guy. He's a, a very deep level investigator of political assassinations, false flags, and other mischievous deeds perpetrated by our, our psychotic puppet masters. In addition, he's always been a good friend, and he's always been inspirational for us and our listeners down through the times that we've been doing Worldly on Belief. And uh, this interview is no exception. Today we talk about a group that he's identified called Operation 40, which is a group of assassins started in the 1950s that have been perpetrating political assassinations, overthrowing governments, and committing false flags since then. We also talk about the Beatles, Paul McCartney, John Lennon. We talk about Bob Marley, which is really interesting, and other assorted topics that come up along the way. Hi, Oli. It's good to hear from you. Uh, we're happy to have you back on World Beyond Belief to tell us about Operation 40. Sounds exciting. Well, I tell you, it's, it's, uh, I've been down this uh, rabbit hole for about, about, about 30 years. <laughs> I just thought the other day that my awakening was 1984. I think that's a very symbolic year. It is a George Orwell's book and so on. <clears throat> but the thing that I, one of the things that I've been focusing on very much over the years are major assassinations in the Western world. U.S. and Europe and so on, assassinations, false flag operations, and so-called terror acts. These are the ones. That, and one of the things I, uh, the level that I put my focus has been on the street level, trying to identify the assassins themselves, their connections and so on, and then through them backtrack it up, trying to get to identifying the real people on, on the street. Because it's always very compartmentalized. Uh, so that every single player only know their little part. Uh, this is done on purpose so that it is very, very hard for anyone to become a whistleblower or to really reveal what, what happened. And, uh, so this is what I've been focusing on for many years. Now, Operation 40, I had no idea about this uh, group until just a few years ago. There was uh, uh, the... the Assassinations I've really looked into is like the JFK assassination, the Robert Kennedy, Che Guevara, <clears throat> John Lennon, Bob Marley, uh, Malcolm X, uh, the Olaf Palma assassination, and, and many others on that level. But one thing that uh, kept uh, confusing me or uh, surprising me was that I bumped into the same names again and again, even though it was in different countries and different continents were people involved in, in the very famous Robert Smith assassination in South Africa, were the same people that blew up uh, Orlando Letier in Washington, D.C. with a car bomb. And I also found them involved in the Ola Palma assassination, and then suddenly some of them in the attacks on, on Bob Marley. And so, so it's just very, very in, you know, mind-blowing. I could not get it until I uh, rewinded back in history to the late 50s, early 1960s, and found out what it was at that point called Operation 40. And this is where I would like to take you today, if that's okay. We'd love to go there with you. Go ahead, okay. Ellie. <laughs> You're the perfect audience. You're we are the perfect, we're, we're on the edge of our chairs, because <laughs> okay. I know that these uh, assassinations are false flags, and I know they're committed by organizations, but Finding the same people uh, or the a network involved is, is totally amazing. So go ahead, why don't you tell us about it, Oli? Okay, in, in the time of the President Dwight Eisenhower, there were some people in the CIA, the military industrial complex, and, and other areas that came up with the idea, why don't we put together an ultra-secret team of assassins and infiltrators 
that can be used globally. Whoever we have problems with, uh, if it's a president or somebody who doesn't want to bow down and, and uh, let us just invade their country or take over whatever we want, we can just eliminate him with the help of this group. Or if we have problems with double agent, as long as this team is ultra secret, then we, we won't have a problem with them. So the task was given to uh, Vice President Richard Nixon at that time, who, what he did was he uh, contacted some old Grey Wolves from, uh, from the CIA. There were people like David Atlee Phillips. Uh, David Atlee Phillips was the controller, CIA handler and controller of the Harvey Oswald, believe it or not, the uh, Patsy of the JFK assassination. He was also the controller of James Files, who was the shooter uh, behind the picket fence in Didi Plaza. According to me, I, I, after all of these years, I totally believe that he was the shooter behind the picket fence. One of many, many, because in Didi Plaza's um, majority of the people involved in the assassination was connected to Operation 40. I, I can go into that afterwards. But he was also, David Atlee Phillips was also the controller later of a man uh, by the name of Michael Vernon Townley. And Michael Vernon Townley was the man later involved in uh, the overthrow of Salvador Allende in Chile in 1973. He was also the one that murdered the Chilean poet ne Paulo Neruda. He was also part of blowing up Orlando Letier in Washington, D.C. And he was on site when Olaf Palme was assassinated in 1986. It, the, he was also part of the assassination of Robert Smith in, in South Africa and so on. The, these people have just been like put on tour, transported from country to country to take out people, whoever was the, the problem. Anyway, so you had Ted Shack, no, David Atlee Phillips, you had another man called uh, Ted Shackley. People were later the uh, covert operations for the to complete Western Hemisphere for the CIA. I mean, that is massive. Ted Shackley took over after David Atlee Phillips, and they, they've been just been involved in so much mayhem in the Western world. It's just incredible. Ted Shackley was also uh, very, very involved in uh, Vietnam, in the whole thing called Operation Phoenix where Operation 40 was extremely central in this whole mass assassination program of Viet Cong and Vietnamese people and so on. Amazing. So these two guys, together with E. Howard Hunt, who was later famous for uh, being connected to the Watergate burglary, uh, these three uh, CIA officers were given a task by uh, Richard Nixon to form this group. So what they did was they, they brought in another player. His name was George Herbert Walker Bush. That's George Bush Sr., mm -hmm. a young man at that time, CAA operative. And he was put uh, in charge of the finances for this group. He was the guy that funneled the funds into this team of assassins. So here we have three presidents, uh, Eisenhower, Nixon, and Bush connected already there. So... People in the background, you had Alan Dulles was very much uh, involved in this, and uh, uh, William Harvey, you know, these uh, Wild Bill Donovan, these uh, Donovan, these, uh, what do you call it, major personalities in the CIA at that time. All of them were involved in this. So uh, Operation 40 was created, and <clears throat> uh, what they did was uh, these CIA people went down to Miami and started recruiting uh, exiled Cuban, mostly exiled Cubans. These were mercenaries, soldier of fortune. They were, were former Batista police officers, high-ranking ones. They were from the also from the, the Fidel Castro troops that had just invaded Cuba, uh, from the Air Force. Uh, there were people, all of them. I mean, these were military people, most of them, very violent, uh, disciplined to some some extent, but people that were recruited into this group. And uh, to start with, there were about 80 of them. 80 men and one woman. Her name was Marita Lorenz. And uh, according to her, Lee Harvey Oswald was also connected to Operation 40. But anyway, these people were then taken, uh, they were trained in Louisiana, north of Lake Pontchartrain. They were trained in the Everglades in, in Florida. And they were also trained in Guatemala, in everything from jungle warfare to 
explosives, poisons, you, you name it, whatever could kill a person, they would be trained in it. And uh, so to start with, they, their first task was to get rid of Fidel Castro. And uh, here in the background you had companies like United Fruit, Standard Oil and so on. They came to the CIA saying, listen, we are losing millions here and we need you to act. Because I think a lot of people don't, do not understand that the CIA, it's an agency for hire. It is, we're talking cold business. All of this uh, talk about the national security is uh, absolutely not true most of the time. This is cold, ice cold business. And uh, the CIA is like an enforcer using different, uh, sometimes the military force, but uh, many times assassins like this to just eliminate whatever obstacle is in the way for these companies to just brutally move in into foreign countries and just take over the whole thing. But they were, they were unable to, uh, to get Fidel Castro. Is that because they made a deal with Castro? Or is it because they were unable to uh, whack him? It's, I, I tell you, I don't know. It's, like, it's almost like Fidel Castro have had like a guardian angel because my God, they have tried so many times and they failed every single one. I, I don't know. It's, it's amazing that he still that he, ma he managed to survive, but they, they sure tried and they failed every single time. And the reason why the woman in this group was recruited, Marita Lorenz, was because she was actually the, the, the lover of Fidel Castro. She was only 18. She was uh, the daughter of a German uh, uh, captain on a big uh, cruise ship that came to Havana in, I think, in, in 1958 or 59. And uh, Fidel Castro had seen uh, this beautiful ship come into harbor, so he went out there and, you know, dressed in guerrilla clothes as always. He, he just wanted to check out a ship like that because he had never seen it and was invited on board by the captain and there was his daughter, Marita Lorenz. And uh, after that, uh, Fidel really fancied her, so he, he called her afterwards and actually uh, got her to Cuba where she stayed, I think, for about 18 months in a hotel. And, but he, she was not treated well and he, I think that he, she became pregnant and Castro forced, at least this is what she claims, that he forced an abortion on her. They, they drugged her and uh, forced an abortion on her. And she was about five months pregnant. And after that, she became very uh, hateful of, of Fidel. And that, that is when she was recruited by another member in Operation 40, this was her name, a man by the name of Frank Sturgis. Uh, Frank Sturgis later became quite famous for uh, He was one of the Watergate burglars. I would also say that he was uh, one of the shooters at Dili Plaza. He was the one in the manhole uh, beneath the grassy knoll. Uh, you have, uh, like, there's this, uh, what do you call it, stone water uh, drainage thing right. under the pavement. What, what do you call that? It's a storm drain. Storm drain. That, were, that's the one. He was in a storm and one, one of the shooters were uh, on, under the manhole and shooting out through the storm drain. This man has been identified by Professor Fetzer and other JFK experts as Frank Sturgis. He has also bragged about being the one that killed Kennedy. Uh, but I believe that the final headshot was actually several shots being fired at the same time from different directions. But we can go into that more later. Fascinating. But, but Frank Sturgis uh, was the man who was... Uh, strange background. He's, he was like a, a soldier of fortune and he was, uh, I don't know how, if he infiltrated uh, the group around Castro on purpose or if he started as a supporter of Castro and then turned against him, I'm not sure. But uh, through a man called Pedro Diaz Lanz, who was, uh, uh, he was recruited by, by Fidel Castro and Che Guevara when, when they did the revolution and took over on Cuba. And uh, Pedro Diaz Lanz was put in charge of the uh, of the Air Force. He then named Frank Sturgis, I think, deputy director or whatever you call it, deputy chief of the Air Force. So he was way up there. At the same time, connected to Operation Forty, planning to get rid of Castro. So he was sort of like a double agent at that time. But this Frank Sturgis has 
over the years after that um, been involved in a lot of in absolutely incredible stuff when it comes to to so-called terror acts or, or, or anti-Cuban um, hits, all type of bombs and they've been trying to shoot with bazookas on, on Castro when he's uh, given talks and, and so on. But also, uh, I've, I've just recently found out that he was, uh, this Frank Sturgis, his, his real name was Frank Fiorini, but that he was actually involved also in the assassination of the Portuguese Prime Minister uh, Francisco Sa Caniero that was blown to pieces in a little Cessna together with the, the, the Minister of Defense as well. On uh, December 1st, John Lennon was signed, another member of, of, of the facility as well. And it's now been more or less proven that uh, Frank Sturgis was the one that delivered the bomb that blew up this plane and that he was working together with Oliver North, later very, very connected to Operation 40 and the Holy Land Contra scandal, and together with another man who was, uh, uh, he was uh, the ambassador of Lisbon at that time, Frank Carlucci. Uh, later, this man was part of, of the Carlyle group, but he, was, he went straight from being the ambassador in Lis Lisbon uh, to becoming the director, um, what do you call it, deputy director of the CIA. So these three, Sturgis, uh, Oliver North, and Carlucci, was very much involved in uh, the Portuguese prime minister, which is still a mystery, or it's still a mystery. People who have dug into it have known the real truth for many years, but still to this day, officially, there's uh, ongoing uh, investigations around this assassination, even though it's like 30 years ago and so on. Wow. Did you say before, so, uh, only one, th one second, did you say that John Lennon was part of uh, Operation 40? Or did no, that... he, was he was killed by a member oh. of Operation 40. Okay. Uh, it's good that you keep me on track because this is such a big group, so uh, please help me back on track if I get, get lost. But uh, if you want to, the John Lennon hit was uh, done, well, you, you got the official story where uh, Mark Chapman, the so-called assassin, he was standing waiting outside the Dakota building the whole day in New York City, waiting for John to come back from the studio because he and Yoko Lena and Yoko Ono had, were just about to release uh, his big comeback album. He was also planning a big peace tour both in the States and I believe in Europe as well. So he was a man who was absolutely hated by the people that re represented the military industrial complex, the FBI, the CIA, and so on. Because John Lennon, just like Bob Marley, Diana, and other people, with that kind of popularity, when they stand up for peace, that becomes a major problem for the military industrial complex, because they thrive on death and destruction. And this is why so many of these beautiful people have been taken off, because they have been an obstacle for this group, and they have just eliminated them one by one by one. But this evening, when John Lennon was killed, it was, I think it was the 10th of December, uh, 1980, he came home in the evening together with Yoko. They came in the limo from the, from the studio. Uh, the limo stopped right outside the Dakota building, and Yoko uh, began walking in towards the entrance. There's a big, big entrance. And uh, John Lennon uh, followed like five steps, five, six steps behind him. Uh, well, if you look at the official crime scene, uh, this layout of the whole thing, you've got Mark Chapman standing to the right. John Lennon is on the way in through the entrance when <clears throat> several shots are fired and John Lennon falls down, st starts crawling into the building. Yoko Ono comes out screaming. They call for an ambulance. And... Uh, the doorman who is standing on the left hand side, uh, before that he, he has rushed over, grabbed a gun from Mark Chapman and got hold of the police. Uh, they say that as soon as he got hold of the gun, Chapman just went into like a zombie state and was just standing there waiting to be picked up absolutely as a zombie. But when you look at the crime scene evidence, because I always look at the evidence. I don't care what I'm being told. I want to see for my own, with my own eyes, what makes sense here and so on. And when you look at the autopsy protocol of, of uh, John Lennon and so on, 
all shots fired come, came straight from the left. I mean, some of them were so close together that it looked like a single bullet hole. And here we have the so-called assassin that was standing behind and to the right. So how can you, how can that make sense? It doesn't. Instead, you have to look at who stood to the left and was there a bit of possibility for someone to hide there? Well, when the shots were fired, the one standing right to the left was a doorman. Uh, a very nice looking elderly gentleman who, who glasses, a bit bold, nice smile and so on. He worked extra there that evening as the doorman. He disappeared right after the shooting into history. Nobody heard of him and he was only referred to as the doorman for a few days afterwards. But I heard just after he had been hit, there was, uh, I think you can still find it on YouTube, there's a woman at the end she, she, and she's crying and saying he was arguing with the doorman, he was arguing with the doorman when the shots were fired. So this doorman, I started tracking him down, and it turns out that his real name was Jose Perdomo, and for 10 years he was one of the highest ranking officers in Operation 40. Now what are the chances of, of one of the absolute top assassins in US history standing at the exact point where the shots were fired? I mean, and him not being involved. So in my mind, the way I see it, he was the assassin, not Mark Chapman at all. Especially since he was just a fill-in doorman. I mean, he wasn't a normal doorman. He just cruised in and then was never seen again. Exactly. And he worked very closely together with Frank Sturgis for many years. But Frank Sturgis said that he died in 1974. But these people have a very, uh, they have a, an ability of dying and then appearing again under new identity. You know, this is one of the things they do. They die and then they get reborn with a totally new identity, multiple identities, most of them, you know. It, this thing that you see in films with, where somebody is going through, they have like five, six different passports and, and things like that. It's standard procedure. Absolutely nothing just in a film. It's the way it is. In this uh, line of work, that's the way they work. And none of this team was ever indicted or investigated officially, were they? No, God, no. On the contrary, they were they were pardoned by George Bush because several of them were, were put in jail. You had one, his name was Sir Orlando Bosch. He was also called Dr. Death. And he, oh, it's, it's incredible. This guy uh, was a, a kid's doctor, a PD or whatever you call it. Yeah. PD. Pediatrician. Yeah. And uh, nice, nice looking man, very violent. And he was used, I, I've written a book called Coup d'etat in slow motion, Coup d'etat in slow motion. And in that book, uh, just to show what type of people I'm describing, I have uh, just the things that Orlando Bush was sentenced for when he was arrested. And it's like page up, page down, page up, page down, page up, page down of bombs, attacks, assassinations, uh, assassination attempts, kidnappings, unreal. And he's just one of them. And so he was, he was sentenced, he was arrested in the 70s and arrested, put in jail. And who pardoned him? George Herbert Walker Bush. You got another one. Uh, his name was Luis Posada Carillas. I mean, you look into this man's life, it's like a dictionary of terrorism. It is just unreal the level he's been involved in. He was put in jail and pardoned by George Herbert Walker Bush. Incredible, absolutely incredible, if you don't see the connections, because here George Bush Sr. has used this team through his whole career taking out people right, left, and center, whoever he had problems with. This Operation 40, they have changed names from, you know, Operation 40 was just the, the name that they started with, but then over the years, they changed constellations and they changed names depending on what operation they were involved in. But many of the members still active. It's, it's totally incredible. It sounds like Mission Impossible, you know, where they, where it starts off with your mission Mr. Phelps, if you ex accept it, is to, I don't know, bump off the prime minister of blah, blah, blah. And then he opens up his suitcase and he's got these pictures of these people he can use. 
I picture uh, George Herbert Walker Bush doing the same thing. Oh, we'll use uh, Sturgis on this, and then we'll put a, you know, blah, 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 blah. It sounds, sounds just like that. <laughs> it is exactly like that. And, and like uh, my friend, the CIA whistleblower, Chip Tatum, who, who worked in one of these uh, assassination squads directly controlled by, by George uh, uh, Bush Sr. It was called the Pegasus. And, and uh, under the command of, of Chip Tatum, they took out at least 17 people uh, globally. And I believe possibly one of them was this prime minister in, in Portugal. I'm going to talk to Chip about that one. But uh, this is exactly, he describes it as they have like uh, staff meetings, you know, they leave home, they have breakfast, they go, they have a staff meeting, they go through the agenda, who needs uh, to be eliminated, how, who's going to take care of it, no, not you this time, you take it, and maybe we're going to put this formation together there. And, you know, it's, it's cold business, it is just cold business, very scary, I think. Yeah, I can remember hearing a, uh, an interview with Chip where uh, Chip was talking about uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. And somebody said, did you ever meet him? He said, yeah. And he said something to the effect that when he walked in, it was like pure evil entering the room. And, uh, you know, if you know anything about George H.W. Bush, you know, he's involved with, uh, you know, the MK Ultra and uh, that kind of falter all also. I tell you, Bush is like uh, Bush Senior. He's he's like a, a super um, octopus in this whole thing. He keeps popping up. The Bush family, all the way from Prescott Bush. Uh, do you know, like uh, Prescott Bush? That was George Bush Senior's father. He was the one that that uh, uh, made up the fake uh, Zimmerman telegram, uh, the the telegram that actually made the U.S. Uh, duped the U.S. to enter into the First World War. Then the Bush, together with uh, Alan, the Dulles brothers, Alice and John Foster Dulles, they were part of, uh, especially the Dulles brothers, of architecting the whole uh, Versailles Peace Treaty that totally humiliated and pushed down uh, Germany in a position that was perfect for creating the Second World War, where the Dallas brothers were actually the lawyers for Hitler, and Prescott Bush was one of the people funneling the funds into the Hitler war machine. Then after the Second World War, we had the Dallas brothers, especially Alan Dallas, who were involved in Operation Paperclip, where uh, many, many, I think it was around 1,600 Nazis, scientists, all type of, of skilled people, were exported out of Nazi Germany in total secrecy, through the, the, the Vatican and other lines and getting them into the States uh, and into Latin America and so on. And in the States, they were part of building up NASA, the CDC, uh, the OSS that then was turned into the CIA and so on. And then yep. the Dulles brothers were very deep involved in the JFK assassination as well as Bush, George Bush Sr. So it's the same small group that are just coming again and again and again and again. And still doing it now. They are. This is, this is why I spend so much effort in trying to expose them, because it's only, if this had been like 50 years ago and that was it, okay, fine, history is interesting, but it, I wouldn't really care that much. But it's because these people are still there doing it to us. These are the people that are part of what is called the New World Order, pushing this world into such a, the way they want it, into such a dark, dark future for the rest of us. And it, that's not on when it comes to me. I, I want a beautiful, beautiful future for the rest of us, but we need to expose what's going on. And the truth will help us set us free from, from this, but we need to wake up and see, see what is happening. Right. And they're not, they're not doing just shootings, because I know Bob Marley was killed by an infection, wasn't he? No, perfect. We can take the one by one by one like this. Now, Bob Marley, he was, some people see him as a, a pot-smoking, dreadlock uh, musician. That is so far from the truth that you can come. This was a very, very, very strong political figure. And 
when he was a, when he was killed, I th I would I almost dare to say that he was the the most powerful black person on the, this world. In this world, he was so powerful. He was such an icon, uh, and with his lyrics and his music, he was reaching into areas in Africa and Jamaica, into groups that 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 had been oppressed for such a long time that the people in power really, really feared him. And uh, at one time, uh, in, I think it was 75, Kissinger and the CIA tried to uh, sort of invade Jamaica, but they did it in, in, a, under, in a stealth way. They went in, they started pumping in loads of heavy drugs, lots of weapons. Uh, they sent in a band of guerrillas, mercenaries, and some of that burned down the crops that uh, blew up factories and everything, all of it to create mayhem so that they could get, come to a point where they could have martial law and then take over the country. But uh, it didn't really work. The, the, the situation was extremely tense. But then Bob Marley uh, was asked and also uh, performed a concert where he got both of the leaders of the opposite uh, parties up on stage, shaking hands. You know, absolutely incredible the, that he was that he was able to do that. But together with or before this concert, there was an, an attack on his life, and he was uh, Bob Marley and his wife and his uh, manager were they were rehearsing in his house, and they were standing out in the kitchen having a coffee and so on when some, somebody suddenly opened the back door and started firing right into to the kitchen. Uh, I think his, uh, his uh, manager he was hit five times, his wife was hit in the back of the head, and he was, uh, a, a bullet striped his, uh, his chest, but uh, lodged in his left arm. But even though that happened, he still went through and, and did the concert, which was, it just showed these powers behind the attack that this guy is unstoppable. But after that, uh, the, this attack, there was this, uh, like he was surrounded by, by like Rastafari bodyguards and so on. <clears throat> but at that time, there was a documentary maker that came to, to Jamaica, and he asked for a session with Bob, and uh, Bob said, okay. And this man, he said, that I, I really want to do a, a documentary about your life and all the things that you're, you're trying to accomplish and, and so on. And... As a sign of uh, friendship, he, he had a pair of cowboy boots that he gave to to uh, Bob Marley. And Bob was very, very, very fun. You know, he was extremely fit. He was very much into soccer, football. And also he loved jeans and boots and that time. So he was really happy. And there was uh, especially one witness that was there. His name was Liu Liu, a photographer, who uh, um, an acclaimed photographer. And he said that when Bob pulled on one of the boots, he just cried out, and uh, because when he pulled off the boot, uh, he he took his hand and went into the boot and managed to pull out like a piece of copper wire that had punctured his uh, big toe, and this is the exact big toe where he later developed a very very rare form of cancer, and this cancer was then later that thing that killed him in eighty one several years down the line, but this cancer just spread and spread and spread. And uh, so I would say it's pretty interesting to, to know who this uh, documentary maker was. His name was actually Carl Colby, and he's the son of William Colby, Bill Colby, the former director of the CIA. Wow. So the question is, what are the chances, you know, what are the chances of this happening if it was not on purpose? I'm not saying Carl Colby did it on purpose purpose because you can be duped into you know he is not he is not uh, totally necessary that he was aware of this that there was this copper wire in the boot uh, but he was the one delivering the gift and Carl Colby is quite interesting because he was later one of the main witnesses in the OJ Simpson uh, case he lived uh, he and his wife lived uh, next door to Nicole when when she was they he was one of the witnesses saying that O.J. had been there harassing her and, and all of these things. So here we have another person, a key person who pops up in two or three of, of the major conspiracy events or whatever you want to call them in a few decades. So I well, think it's, it's very important to point out these things. 
Right. I, I, I'm not so easy on, on him. I think his father was, was head of the CIA. I mean, there you go. I th you know what the CIA is. You, you said it in the beginning, that they're just a rogue band of... No, but I'm, I'm saying that the, boot, the, the boots came from the CIA, no doubt about it. I'm not saying that Carl necessarily knew about that they were a tool of assassination. Right. I'm, I'm saying for sure the, the boots came from the CIA. And Bill Colby was, uh, we were talking about Chip Tatum before, Bill Colby was uh, the guy who, who recruited Chip Tatum. He was. And, and, and held him under his wing yeah, and also warned him against George Bush Sr. big time, really, really making sure that uh, uh, that uh, Chip got what he called insurance, a lot of heavy, heavy evidence against George Bush Sr. and so on that could protect him. Then later, Bill Colby was assassinated as well in a so-called accident, a drowning accident, but that was a pure assassination as well. So you knew you knew a lot more about Bill Colby than I did when I was entering my comment. You know, it seems like... Well, Bill, Bill Colby, I, I just want to say Bill Colby was very, very uh, central also in the, in the creation of the so-called uh, Stay Behind movement in all, all NATO countries in Europe. Uh, the whole ghost army called Gladio or Stay Behind, he was very central in that. He was, uh, at the time, in, he was an uh, ambassador in, in Stockholm, actually, and working together with Olaf Palme, that was later assassinated, in building up, creating this whole ghost army, the Gladio network, before he became uh, the director of the CIA. <clears throat> but he was also very central in Operation Phoenix, in, in the whole Vietnam War. I mean, these they're key people, key players in so much death and destruction all over the world. Well, so Gladio B, is. how would you say Gladio B fits into Operation 40? Do you think there's... Is I, it think that the, I, th I think that the, Gla the Gladio network is where lots of, of new generation assassins are, and mercenaries are, are recruited from, you know, because so these hidden networks with right-wing, very disciplined, uh, violent people are the perfect place to recruit new ones. So the whole thing is integrated, I would say. And Operation 40 has been very central as well. Key members of them have been very central when it comes to educating new assassins or people, uh, you know, uh, learning them torture techniques or uh, assassination techniques or these type of things. They were very central uh, when Salvador Allende was taken out on 9-11-1973. They were part of murdering him. Uh, I know Michael Van Townley was one of them, uh, Luis Posida Carriles was one of them, in where they actually were there when, when uh, Salvador Allende was killed, and so, so was James Files, uh, the shooter of the, from the picket fence, who said that he was there, he saw Allende being shot. And these people in Operation 40 was then put in charge of, of training the Chilean military and police in interrogation techniques, torture, killings, assassinations, all of these things. And then they, they were sent, you know, from, they were in Chile, they were in Peru, Bolivia, Angola, Mozambique, uh, all of these different things, the Vietnam, many of them were there, Cambodia, and so on. So wherever there was a war going on, where the CIA was involved, they sent these people. Wow, so they also have to be so, hooked hooked into a thing called the School for the Americans. Have you heard of that? I'm sure you have. It's a. I, could you repeat that, please? There's a uh, there's a situation in the United States around Atlanta called the School for the Americas, and it's a training ground for assassins that they send back into South America. In other words, they recruit people, send them to the School for the Americas. And then they teach them to kill and torture, and then they send them back yeah. to Latin America to work on these things, probably under the direction of the Operation Forty. I, is this school still around? Because I know it was uh, some years ago. Is it still active? I'm not sure. And even if it, uh, even if it doesn't exist anymore, I'm sure that the function is taken taken care of. Because there were a yeah, lot of there yeah. were a lot of protests around it after a while. I remember. Yeah, for sure, because these people, 
these people have been working closely also to people like uh, Manuel Noriega or Somoza, you know, these people that later became dictators in different countries and so on. They were very much involved with them. And also, uh, I think Luis Posada Carillas was one of the, uh, the teachers at this uh, uh, institute that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So, yes, for sure. But Operation 40, I, I need to repeat that this was only the name they started out with. Then it's changed over the years. But the same, the core group of this uh, have just been going on, going on, going on. So another one in this uh, group was a man called Felix Rodriguez. Uh, Felix Rodriguez was, uh, he was like the, the right hand of, of uh, George Bush Sr. He was a former Cuban cop uh, under the Batista regime, a notorious so-called freedom fighter. And he was later a key Iran Contras operative and special confidant of George Oliver Walker Bush. Uh, he was uh, later a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, and but in the Iran Contras, he and Oliver North was work, working very tight together with, with the whole you know weapons out of the states and cocaine into the states, flown in big, big, big uh, military medevac planes or helicopters by pilots like Chip Tatum and Barry Seal. Barry Seal, who was also another member of Operation Forty. He, so, uh, but Felix Rodriguez, uh, not only was he uh, involved in this whole thing, but he was also the one that was uh, sent down to take care of Che Guevara. Che Guevara, who was uh, uh, one of the colleagues of Fidel, Fidel Castro, and this, they were having a major problem with this Che Guevara because he was becoming like an icon, a freedom icon for the rest of the countries in, in Latin America and so on. So, he was sent down together with uh, another member of uh, Operation 40, a man called De David Morales, or David Morales. They went down to Bolivia, uh, they get, got help from some local military people down there, and they tracked Che Guevara down. There was a shootout, and uh, Che Guevara was captured, and then Felix Rodriguez ordered him killed. And the one who killed, this is not the official story, this is, as far as I know, the truth, the one that actually killed him was David Morales. Uh, it is even said that he, he, he cut the head of uh, Che Guevara and kicked it into the bushes and so on. But that was after that they had uh, had the, the body lying on uh, Farad so that people, local people could take photos and see that he was actually dead and so on. It's said that uh, Felix uh, had uh, the, uh, the rich watch of uh, Che Guevara, well, I I think he still has it, if he's still alive, I'm not sure. I know that in 2004 he was the chairman of the Bay of Pigs Veterans Association. So, uh, but he was also involved in the Watergate burglary. And when you see the Watergate burglary, you will see that all the members, except for James McCord, was connected or was part of Operation 40. And they were there as a cleanup team because Richard Nixon was very, very afraid that it would come out in the open, his connections to the JFK assassination and through Operation 40. So that is why one of the reasons why he, he ordered them to go there and clean this up. But it seems like there's even more another level to this whole thing, because it seems like in the background, the, the one pulling the strings like a, a, a chief manipulator was George Herbert Walker Bush. And that he did it, did this whole thing on purpose to get rid of Richard Nixon, to get him out of the way. So it's very multi layered, these things. But this David Sanchez Morales that I mentioned, he was in Dealey Plaza when the shots were fired. I think in one of the photos you can see that he's, he's standing up holding one of the telephone poles or light posts. Uh, just at the corner of the, uh, where the Texas School Book Depository is. Check, this is right when the shots are fired. He's later, he jumps into a car that is parked on the uh, wrong side of Houston Street, uh, up towards the Texas School Book Depository, when three people are running up behind. The, he picks up two of them, drives north on, on Houston Street, and the third one runs down uh, Houston Street, south and then goes down Main Street towards uh, uh, 
the Adolphus Hotel. This man was Richard Kane, uh, a hitman from under San, uh, San Giancana. He was a former Chicago police officer, so that was like a lieutenant in, in the Chicago mob. But he was also connected to Operation 40, not a member himself, but working in and out with this group as well. But this David Morales, he was also present in the Ambassador Hotel 1968 when Robert Kennedy was killed. And it seems like he was there, uh, you know, uh, keeping control over the situation, being in charge of this operation, together with, because he was the, the chief of operation for what was called the JM Wave uh, Station in Miami, the biggest CIA uh, operation uh, at that time in the world. He was joined by the chief of marine, uh, marine time, maritime operations, Gordon Campbell, and also the chief of psychological warfare operations, George Gioannidis. These three, you can see, they have been identified being filmed in the crowd when Robert Kennedy was uh, was killed. Not saying that they shot him, but that they were there controlling the whole event. I'm not sure that uh, Sirhan Sirhan's uh, gun was the same caliber that killed him, or came from the same direction. I heard there's a lot of ambiguity around that. Yeah, but the, the, this is the thing, you know, this uh, Robert Kennedy, it's an absolute no-brainer, because he was shot, it, you had Sirhan Sirhan, who was, he did shoot, he did fire shots, that is for sure, but his revolver had eight shots in it, 22, caliber 22. He was at no point standing otherwise than straight in front of Robert Kennedy. After the first couple of shots fired, he was, the, the crowd just jumped him and pushed him down on a steam table, wrestling the gun from him, but he still kept shooting. And I think there was five other people that got wounded this day. Uh, but all the shots that hit Robert Kennedy came straight from the back and to the right. I mean, point blank, though, so that they, it, 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 it even sort of like, there were like powder burns on his skull and on his clothes. So, so the whole thing is, also, when you look, when you uh, check out audio recordings that have not been analyzed, it seems like 13 or 14 shots were fired, but there were only eight shots in Sirhan Sirhan's gun, and he were at no point anywhere than straight in front of Robert Kennedy. So it's a it's a no-brainer case. There was a, at least a second shooter. Wow. You know, it's and this this. I'm sorry, the sound is a little out of sync, so I'm sorry if I interrupt you. No, you're not. Go ahead, Oli. You have such good stuff to say. No, it seems like uh, uh, there's a lot of theories going on. Who was standing behind him t uh, to the right? And uh, this evening, there was a man by the name of Thane Caesar, who, who had some mob connections that worked extra with guard this evening. And he was standing right where these shots were fired from. But there are other options as well uh, that uh, to this shooter, I can come, come back to him, to this other shooter, possible shooter, on another occasion. Okay. So, <laughs> there's so many of these guys. Another member was a man called Portugos. He was part of Operation 40 for quite a few years. He's admitted to that, but he said, you know, they always... Uh, make it as a joke and say, well, I did some this and that, but they never go into any details. But this guy followed, uh, he was in Operation 40, and then he followed Bush closely, and he was later appointed uh, as a to CIA director by President Bush, only to very mysteriously resign after this time. At, uh, for a time, he served as the, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, he was also a co-sponsor of the U.S. Patriot Act and a, and a co-chair of the Joint 9-11 Intelligence in, uh, Inquiry. I mean, you know, they, they always uh, make these inquiries uh, which are part of the crime so that their only task is that the real truth will not get out there. That is standard procedure. You kill someone, you're also in charge of the investigation and you're in charge of whatever commissions or inquiries that follows. So just to make absolute sure that the truth, the real truth, will never get out there. Now, this Portagos was also pre present at the infamous breakfast meeting at the Capitol on the morning of 11, September 11, 
2001. World General Mahmoud Ahmad, head of the Pakistani SIE. If you remember, there was a hundred thousand dollars that uh, chain and so on that they that they they looked into a lot. So, uh, should I go on? Oh yeah, I'm I'm amazed. Here's what, <laughs> here's what I'm thinking. A lot of these people that were assassinated, uh, especially people like Marley Lenin. Uh, some of these high-ranking political figures like Robert Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, they were originally selected. You know, John Lennon and, and the Beatles, there's a whole uh, legend behind Tavistock orchestrating that whole group and how it brought in the values that Tavistock wanted to bring in. And then when they start breaking away or becoming powerful on their own, like Che Guevara, uh, Bob Marley, then they have to be iced, and they send in this group of they were like they were like uh, the the cleanup men or something. Yeah, they can they call them that as well. You know, the cleaners or, or exactly the plumbers or you know to to get rid of the leakages or stuff like that. So for sure. And this whole Beatles thing is one very, very, very strange arena, I tell you. Uh, at the moment, I'm part of a, a book series together with Jim Fetzer and uh, other very uh, world experts in the area. And uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole series of uh, uh, chapters around the fake Paul McCartney. Right. Be because the thing is, this is an area I normally try to avoid but now when you when you open up the, this whole thing with the, 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 the Beatles thing, the, there's quite a lot of possible evidence that shows that the, the Beatles explosion was planned and used as a diversion to take away the attention away from the Kennedy assassination because they, they had their big breakthrough just a month or two after the Kennedy assassination. And the whole thing just exploded in a way that was totally incredible. And the, the things that uh, has come forward are from people in the MI6 and so on. So it's not just uh, rumors. I mean, you always have to be afraid, uh, aware of possible disinformation. But when it comes from heavy sources like that, you, you need to look at it as well. And it seems like this group was put together together just like a boy band uh, like boy bands are nowadays put together to and um, backed up by the Tavistock Institute uh, delivered you know with uh, all of these uh, what was needed to to get this incredible impact <clears throat> and also like uh, the whole screaming thing you know th that was it seemed like a lot of the first crowds were paid to do the screaming, you know, they didn't know why they just scream, and then that right. would start the whole the whole screaming avalanche. But it's um, it seems like in 1966 that Paul McCartney actually died in a car crash, and that uh, the MI6 uh, that they decided to uh, invest in this group because they had already invested so much. And there was a lot of um, money uh, revolving around this uh, whole thing, not only for the band, but for big, big uh, uh, powers around them. And so that they, they decided to, to exchange the dead Paul McCartney with a new one, a lookalike. And <clears throat> there's especially a, a, an Italian uh, couple, uh, a pair of, of forensic investigators that have looked very much into... The, the whole facial structure, the teeth, the, the ear, the, the ear shapes, the head size compared to the body, all of these type of things, and it does not match up at all. The man, the man that is now Paul McCartney, and the one that was before 1966, they look quite similar, but they're totally not the same person. When you look at forensic evidence, absolutely, I've seen just pictures that make them look different. Also, I read this book by a couple of books by Dr. John Coleman. Have you gotten in his stuff? Committee of 300 and Tavistock. He wrote two yeah. books. Yeah. And, and he claims that there's a man named, I think his name's Michael Adorno. Is that his name, Michael? 
who uh, was experimenting with different sounds. Uh, actually, in Germany, he was asked to leave Germany because he was corrupting children. And he created a, a different type of, of uh, how can I say, it's not the syncopation. They did use voodoo uh, beats, but, but in the actual music, it's a different tonality. And this tonality had a real uh, disquieting um, effect on the listeners. So this Adorno person wrote most of the original Beatle music that came out, supposedly, according to Dr. John Coleman in his books. But it's... Uh, I, I know it sounds way out there, but the more you look into it, the more it seems like it, this is the real thing. Because also the the rest of the band members in the Beatles started calling Paul McCartney for Fall McCartney. You can hear that George uh, Harrison, he, he keeps uh, referring to right in front of him, saying Fall, very clearly not Paul, fake Paul, Fall. And they left like so many uh, clues in the album covers and in their music. And, and anyway, what I wanted to say was that uh, George Harrison was almost murdered. A man entered his, uh, his mansion and stabbed him very severely. Uh, so he was very close to, to dying. And it, he claims, at least sources claim, that George has said that John Lennon phoned him just a few days before he died saying, I'm going to go open with, with this. I've had enough with, this, uh, with, uh, with Fall. I'm going to go open with it. And that that could be one of the reasons he was taken out at, when he was killed. Wow. Which leads me to another topic. It seems to me that now they're taking people out with things other than bullets. I mean, if you look at the murder of, uh, I think murder, of Michael Jackson, he was taken out with a heart attack. And I know that, uh, well, according to the people that uncovered Project Blue Beam, if you give any credibility to that, uh, they were both taken out with heart attacks shortly after they released the... Uh, release the documents. But I think they can give you cancer. I think they can give you heart attacks. What do you think about that? For sure. This is this is since the 50s. Nothing new there. Nothing new there. So so even these, um, so we might be able to relate these things that seem like, well, not accidental deaths, but just natural deaths, back to this Committee of 400. Let's take a short break and we'll be, be back with Oli Damagard in a few minutes. Welcome back to the World Beyond Belief. We had have Oli Damagard again with us, who's telling us amazing stories about the... Uh, about the dog next door? <laughs> yeah, about the dog next door. About Operation 40. And the, all everything that happened in the 20th century in terms of assassinations, uh, star makers, and uh, what we... As we were experiencing the 20th century, what was really going on behind the scenes? We've related it to Operation Gladio and a lot of things that happened in South America. But let's continue with Oli. Go ahead, Oli. Pick up where we left off. I think we were talking, we were finishing up on the Beatles and the false, false Paul. It's uh, like I mentioned, I, I'm involved in a book now with uh, Jim Fetz, uh, Jim Morris, uh, Sam Gardner, and quite a lot of other experts. The first edition is called, uh, and I guess we didn't go to the moon either. It's, uh, it's just about to be launched. Uh, one of the topics is uh, the moon, the fake moon uh, landings. The other one is uh, the fake Beatles uh, member, Paul McCartney, or Paul McCartney. Right. Another one is the Holocaust hoax. Uh, and the, the fourth one is that, Actually, Bin Laden 
was uh, there was a double involved, at least one double around Bin Laden because he he died already in 2001, just after 9/11. But they had several different uh, doubles doing these uh, video tape video fake things. But also Saddam Hussein, that actually the one that was hung was not the real Saddam Hussein, but that he was flown out. It's absolutely an incredible book, and uh, I can very much recommend it. I'm, I'm helping with the cover and design, and also I'm writing uh, a chapter in, in the second book about the false flag operations. But in that book, uh, that is, it's going to be available soon on, on Amazon and everywhere, I hope. But in that book, uh, uh, there's like four different chapters about the fake uh, Paul McCartney thing, because because it's so much more than just theories. Absolutely. It is, it, it, for me, when you start talking about this one, this is a touchy area because people just start and going. You can see they see in their eyes. It's all like, oh my God, here, not that one. But actually, when you look into it, there's so much evidence pointing to a totally different truth than, than we're being served. And also, Paul McCartney's uh, one of his former wives have come forward big time, also saying that uh, there's this incredible secret, and she's been threatened. Or, as you know, I think she's even been threatened uh, to to die if she started to speak out. But she's been on many different talk shows talking about this whole thing. And it it, it well, you read the book for yourself, and and uh, I th I think it's a very interesting book. If we can get a uh... A link to it or something up on our website. That's what we'll do to promote that thing. That sounds great. It is. It is also, if I can jump a little, there's one main, uh, one of the four parts in this first book is about the Holocaust hoax, and this one, if there is any touchy area, any area you should not enter if you want to stay, keep your career, if you want to keep your credibility, if you want to keep. Uh, not being attacked, that is one area you should avoid. Uh, in some countries, it's even, uh, you you will get sentenced to jail, long jail sentences, if you, you even criticize the official story of the Holocaust. Because of that, I've just made a major interview on Red Eyes Interview, Red Eyes Creations. It's going to be aired here in a few days on Wednesday, which will be the 20th of May or something like that. The reason why I, I've t taken this step forward, because I felt nervous before doing that, it is not because I'm a super expert in this area. I know a lot, I must commit, uh, admit, but the reason why I, I have taken this step forward is that I will follow the truth wherever it takes me. Truth will lead us to freedom. Truth will set us free. But we need to follow it. We need to use our minds and see what really happened. Are we being duped? Are we being totally conned into different areas? And just like Voltaire said, if you want to find out who controls you, see who you're not allowed to criticize. And here we have the Holocaust hoax or the Holocaust situation where you will be jailed if you even put questions out there. And once you look at the evidence of the so-called Holocaust, you will find that it makes absolutely no sense. The numbers are totally skyrocketing wrong. The so-called gas chambers did not work the way they, they said, you know, like the Treblinka gas chamber, this whole thing was built around a diesel engine and you cannot die from diesel fumes. Even if you try to, I mean, some car companies even make commercials, you know, showing, you know, the guy is trying to kill himself with a hose in through the, from the exhaust pipe into the, and he just wakes up feeling great. You cannot physically do that. And it's the same, you know, like with Auschwitz and so on, when you look into it, it does not make sense. I only use Farmer Brown's logic. One plus one equals two. And here, the facts does not match up. It's... And, and you will see, like, for instance, in, in uh, the, um, like, there's one of the concentration camps. I mean, there were hundreds of them. But it really, really seems like these were working camps, labor camps, not extermination camps. 
please read the book, listen to the interviews. I don't want to go into great detail here, but it, it's just uh, one of these areas where, in my opinion, we have been taken for an incredible, they, they duped us into believing this, and they're using this one as a shield around their super criminal activities, because as soon as you even point a finger at the group behind uh, some people that are part of this whole New World Order, you will be called an anti-Semite, -Sem uh, I don't even know the English name, anti-Semitite, uh, or a Jew hater or something like that. It has nothing to do with this. I only look for the truth. Whoever, wherever it will take me, if it's Islam, if it's Muslims, Jews, white, blue, green, it does not matter. The truth is still the truth. So now let's get back to Operation 40. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so another guy in this group was a man called Johnny Rosselli. Uh, Johnny Rosselli was a very flamboyant uh, type, you know, big white uh, teeth, uh, glasses. He loved Hollywood. He loved mingle with the, with the film stars and so on. But he was actually a former hitman for Al Capone. And around the JFK assassination that time, he was uh, the liaison between the mob and the CIA and also the whole Hollywood set and so on. He was in the Deltics building when the shots were fired and he later ended up uh, chopped up in small little pieces in an oil drum, I think, in, uh, well, in an oil barrel drum in Hudson Bay or something like that floating around there. Many of these people have lived by the gun and died by the gun very violent lives and ended up uh, dead like that as well. So, uh, Wait, um, on Red Ice Radio, I, I heard somebody on Red Ice Radio, and I think it was you, talking about how they start to train these assassins from childhood. Was it you? It could have been me, but this, this is a very, some of the, the, the ways that they, these people have been trained is very, very awful. I mean, they're victims themselves, I would say. Some of them have been, uh, I know especially there's uh, uh, two that are still alive, Walter Topinski and Clyde Forshaw, both of them uh, living in Toronto. Uh, they have been used as assassins since the late 50s when they were very young kids, all the way up until uh, a year ago when I and Jim Fetzer exposed them. And as far as I know, uh, both of them have about a thousand people on their uh, conscious, used as assassins, as cleaners. And it's like when you look into the JFK assassination and other of these major assassinations, there's very often a long, long row of victims around them, people that have been suicided, car accidents, uh, blown up, uh, killed, murdered. You only hear about the, the, these killings, but you never hear about who carried them out. And here we are, these are two of the people that, that have done them. And they were, as far as I know, they were born, uh, like Clyde Forshaw was born in 43, Wojtzebinski 40, and as children, they were taken care of by, uh, as far as I know, an SS officer that trained them in the art of killing. You know, they started with with uh, animals and then they went over, they began with children and then it just went up, you know, women and then in the end, anyone. And so it's an awful, gruesome thing. And very often you will see also that these uh, killers have been somehow connected with MK Ultra or naval air bases where they've done all types of awful experiments on them and, and things to get them into a, a situation where they can be totally controlled. Awful stuff, absolutely awful. Sounds like their birth and their young life correspond with Operation Paperclip and the, and yeah. the, the importing of 500 or, or more psychologists. You know, I always laugh. You want to bring over uh, Nazi psychologists. What kind of project would a Nazi psychologist be involved in? It's not hard to figure out. Uh, no, and, and these people, you have to see that, as far as I know, they were part of building up the whole 
uh, OSS that turn into the CIA. Because these are very intelligent people, very structured, very efficient, super good at what they're doing. The whole surveillance, uh, that whole thing. Also the, the rocket scientists, they were part of building up uh, NASA. You have uh, different type of experts that I believe uh, was part of starting what was called the CDC, where we started exactly at the same time in '46 as well, the Center of Disease Control. This is the, the same center that keeps coming up when we had all of these scares, when if it's not the swine flu, then it's the, uh, the Ebola, if it's not the Ebola, soon it would be the upside down blown up monkey, camel right. flu or whatever. Do you know, they just make up these things, but they are the ones having the patent. There is an actual patent for the Ebola virus. How is that possible? Ebola is said to be an, an awful disease. No, it's not a, it's a constructed disease. It is created and it even has a patent. And this patent is owned by the CDC. This is located right outside Atlanta or in Atlanta. And that is also where the latest Ebola scare, the, the epicenter of the Ebola, whole Ebola thing, where it came from. So every time these things happen, this is the whole point of these interviews and all of this is to see the, how the dots are connected and see how few people are involved in so much, meaning that we do not live in a totally crazy world. We do not live in a world that is totally inhabited by violent Muslim terrorists who want to blow us up or chop our heads off. We do not live in a world that is totally crazy where the world has gone, or nature has gone wild and everything. You, you, whatever you look into almost, you will, it will track you back to the same small group again and again and again. Excellent. Which gives me absolute super faith and, and hope for the future. Because what you're looking at is just like in The Wizard of Oz. You have this very old guy, very tiny, weak person, or group of people behind a curtain because they only can they can only work in in the dark where they're not seen with a microphone and a massive big amplifier. That amplifier is media pumping out that they are powerful and we are not. But it's actually if you turn off the if you turn down the volume or take away the microphone from them, they have nothing. You know, we say Ooh, this elite, they're so powerful. they got all these weapons. they all got all these armies. Most of them are old guys. I tell you, if you give them a laptop and say, listen, I've got a virus, could you please fix it? They would not be able to do it. Yeah, but this group, they've got drones and they've got all this kind of high tech. They would not know how to do any of it without the cooperation of us. We are the ones doing it to ourselves. So anyone who are part of this game against humanity, many times without knowing it, needs to wake up and see what's going on. It is your duty as a human being to wake up and see what you're taking part of. doesn't matter if, the, if you're well paid or, or if you get a great contract delivering missiles to blow up innocent people in innocent countries. There's no honor whatsoever in it. And you have to understand also the, the law of karma. What you are part of creating will come back to you. So the sooner you wake up and start helping and messing up this beautiful world for all of us, the better. Same goes for people in uniform. Poor people, many of them duped into believing that they're doing the right thing. It is wakey, wakey time, big time. That was great. I had a couple questions, but you were doing so well, and I'm just getting so inspired. As you know, I didn't start out this interview with, uh, I mean, in the, in the happiest of moods. You've got me all fired up now. Good work, all. I know there's nothing. There's nothing like uh, talking about assassins and. Uh, <laughs> well, no. <laughs> things like that to get the mood up. <laughs> right, but as you were saying this, when you went through the CDC, we did a little research on that. Oh, six or eight months ago, when they were really trying to jam this Ebola thing down our throats. And if you go to Leonard Horowitz's website, do you know who that is? He's, he's oh, yeah, a, I love Leonard. Yeah, he's uh, 
traced Ebola back to Uganda back in the 60s. Maybe, I think it's the late 60s. And uh, our guys are there again, Kissinger and your Dr. Death, the one that you mentioned before, were involved in, in uh, brewing up that little uh, uh, vat of mayhem. That they're... This is the whole. This is the whole thing. You know, when I start talking about like, uh, well, did they land on the moon or did they not? Uh, the whole Cold War thing. Oh, it was so awful. Or all, all of these false flag operations or terror acts or the Muslim. And all of these things. When you look at it, it is it's the same small little group of players is that comes back again and again. You just mentioned two of them, Henry Kissinger, I mean, the worst war criminal in, in the history of humankind. It's unbelievable what this man has been part of. And Bush, these, these type of people, these are the men that, uh, that comes again and again. And so it's not to be a, a conspiracy theorist or, or deep into conspiracies, losing grip of reality. I think it's wonderful you, when you find out that, oh my God, here they are again. It's like, what is David Copperfield good at? He's good at manipulating the minds of people. I don't know how he does his trick or, or how he does, but that is, he's a magician. That is what he's good at. These people are puppet masters. They're good at, they, they, uh, what do you call it? They're good at, at conning us. They're con artists on the highest level. And many times they're not very good. It's just that we are so extremely brain dead that we buy into it again and again and again and again and again. I cannot repeat enough how many times we buy into it. And then apparently we're just as surprised again. Another mass shooting. How strange. Another mass shooting. How strange. Another patsy. Another lone crazy guy. Another lone crazy guy. How many lone crazy guys are there? And when you see the same people thriving in the background from the result, it's like they, this so-called elite, I call them the minority or the lifeless, they do not treat us with a lot of respect. I can totally understand that. Because, I mean, really, how excuse me for saying so, but how thick are we when we do not see what's going on after all of these years and they keep doing, I mean, they, they, it's not that they're very advanced to, you know, that they, they change the, the scenery a lot or they change the manuscript a lot. They do the, the same one again and 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 we're still sitting, oh my God. That is unreal. This is so, you know, strange. Right. Here's what? another thing. Very strange. Go ahead. No, it's just that I, I, sometimes, I must say from the bottom of my heart, I get extremely tired. I have spent 30 years of my life de dedicated to exposing absolute no-brainers for people that does not see it anyway. This, this is not to be rude, but it's just like while we are not, we're still asleep, they move on forward big time, you know. And if we don't wake up, we're screwed. We do not have a very nice future in front of us if we do not wake up. That now you have this Jade Helm 15. I mean, they are planning a big crescendo. So it's a very, now it's a very good time to wake up and see what's going on. Because the truth will help set us free. I think the truth in itself will, is so powerful. Well, your book, the book that you're writing with Jim and, and uh, the others, I think that's incredibly important because here's how I see it happening. I think that there are things like the Holocaust and all the stuff around the Beatles and the whole Aquarian conspiracy, which is what Tavistock called that and the moon landing. And it's like they're, uh, they're held up with thumbtacks on a bulletin board. And when you pull the thumbtack out, their whole game falls apart. When you realize that the Holocaust 
actually actually didn't occur. If you want more information on that, Dennis Wise, I'm sure you know Dennis Wise's work on that. Uh, it's, it's, he has a series called The Greatest Story Never Told. It's on YouTube oh, if you can. It's very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. It, it'll blow your mind. But when you pull these pins out, their whole game falls on the floor. That's why that book is so critical. And what's the name of it again, Ollie? And I guess we didn't go to the moon either. And I guess we didn't go to the moon either. Um, to the moon. To the moon. Right, that's a good book to have on your coffee table so when somebody comes over and you're just chatting and you want to get them awakened, you know, it's a catchy title and I'm sure... If Ollie and Jim Fetzer, we we interviewed Jim a couple of weeks ago, uh, are involved, and Jim Mars, and I'm, Zen, and Zen, I'm ama I'm sure it's going to be totally amazing. So it is, I tell you, and it's on the back of the book. Uh, there's a quote saying, "This might be the most important book in the world right now." No, some people say that this might be that this is the most important book in the world right now, and then it says they might be right. It's great. Well, be, 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 because the whole thing, I believe that what, when they took when they took out JFK, this group really moved in. This small little, little group of of uh, pull, string pullers moved in big time and just said, "Okay, let's go for it." And in so many different areas, uh, from '63 and forward, this group is behind it. And they're just, uh, can you call it deceptors? Can you, is that, can you call that? Deceive. Deceptors. They're, Deceivers. They're like, deceited. They're like uh, con artists that have moved in, but super criminals and very, very brutal, violent con artists that have just got into power like a super mob and just pushed forward. So in so many different areas, it's not, you know, if you say that the, the moon, that that is a hoax. Well, they, they make documentaries around it. Henry Kissinger is part of it. Uh, Ram, what's his name? Uh, not Dick Cheney, the other one. Ramsey. No. Um, my, my, yeah. Rumsfeld. 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 Rumsfeld is in this documentary where they speak openly about it. They speak totally openly about this whole moon fake thing where Nixon... Where the whole Nixon administration and all of that was part of it as well. They speak very openly about it. So we're talking manipulation, manipulation big time. And, and it goes into uh, many different areas. And people who have stood in, in front of them becoming an obstacle, they've gotten, gotten, rid, of, gotten rid of with people like Operation 40. They, that's been their tool the tools of enforcing this this brutal thing on the population of country by country by country by country that these poor countries where they've been it doesn't matter if you look into uh, Angola or you look into uh, different countries in, in Congo or Western Africa and so on, how do they do it you, you look into it, well suddenly you have this Ebola virus suddenly spreading there right that, that's the official stories. So instead of setting medical uh, people down there that are really skilled in taking care of this, they sell down military troops. Right. And why? Because of the diamonds or the minerals and whatnot. And then when you start looking around there, who pops up in the middle of the whole thing? George Bush Senior. Right. And this is the story again and again and again. But they're not getting it from the mainline media, that's for sure. Because they control that one as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. They've taken it over step by step by step. In the old days, there was some free press, but nowadays it's it's a joke. The whole thing is a joke. Do you know, I, I've, I've written a book called Coup de Time Slow Motion. It's almost 1,100 pages. It describes the assassination of the Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palme in 86, which with, with all the connections into the Iran-Contras, even with connections back, back to JFK, into pedophile networking, into the Freemasonry network, into illegal arms trading, into all of these things. I've sent 
Because in Sweden, the official story to this very day is that it was a lone crazy guy that did it. Okay, it's almost 30 years down the line with one of the, it's, I think, the world's longest ongoing murder investigation in the history of the world. Still there, costing an absolute fortune for the Swedish uh, uh, people. Absolute fake, all of it. In my book, I, I describe in great detail, I name all the names of people involved, and with names, photos, what they did, letters from the members that carried that out, who, who drove the escape cars, who was, did the shooting, who delivered the weapons, all of these type of things. Then I've sent to, I think, 1,100 media contacts in Denmark and Sweden saying, I am here, whatever I can do to assist you, just ask me. I sent an email to all of these people saying, please, you're looking, you're still, still at step one, saying, is it the Patsy, is it not? It was not. If you want part of the whole truth, I mean, I've done everything I can to expose the whole truth, but I haven't got the whole picture, but I put 30 years into it. So if you want this for free, my assistance, everything I can do, just send me an email. I will be there. I will send you the book for free. I will do everything I can to assist you. I sent more than 1,100 emails. I got two replies. One of them turned up and made an interview. Does that say something? Absolutely. It says there is some, <clears throat> like there's one conspiracy around the assassination itself, and, and there's a secondary conspiracy of silence. Silence surrounding this whole thing. And is every time you, you get close to these national traumas, you will find the same type of secondary conspiracy of silence that just, it's the official story or shut up. Do not go close. Do not enter this area. And if you keep pushing, you end up dead or beaten or whatever. I had two friends who was murdered, and I had to leave my own country and so on. So th it's not a game, you know. This is there, hitting hard. But I would, I would still say that after all of these years, this is the year it's going to turn around, big time for the better, in a beautiful, absolutely beautiful way. But we need to keep the focus because they, they know that we're on them, that we are exposing them big time. So they're in a hurry to, to get us into the corral as soon as possible. Yes, right. Over here we have... I think this is... Jade Helm. Jade Helm is going to wake more people up than all the effort that you and I and Jim Fetzer and all of us put together uh, down through the years. Jade Helm's going to do a lot. I'll tell you another thing is the uh, transfer... Trans Pacific Partnership. That's that's putting the uh, the lid on the coffin, and that'll wake a lot of people up. But we've been there have been investigators exposing nine one one. I mean, you can find ten videos on YouTube that'll show you exactly who was connected, who benefited financially. How, what was maneuvered right before it happened? The same with Sandy Hook. He, I mean, it's it's blown apart. And the one that's breaking my heart this week is the the what Sarnes brothers on the Boston bombing. Now, the yeah. Boston bombing is is an obvious co hoax. They even used a smoke bomb in actors. The actors that had their limbs blown off showed up at basketball games a week later. I mean, it's it's a total fraud. But this boy is is found guilty by brain dead jurors and probably a, a bought off judge, and he's he's going to be executed. Of course, it'll be many appeals. But how can we continue to do this? How can we, when everybody knows, when it's when it's publicly available, you know? It it beats me. I don't get it. I don't get it. <coughs> But, but it's so good that you mentioned like the, this, uh, this poor young guy because he's the real victim. Or he's more, I mean, there, there was a reason why, why they pulled the Boston bombing off. It's all the things, their solution that they have served us afterwards, which is more and more surveillance, more and more. Right. You know, for us to accepting <clears throat> torture and drones and Robocops and all of these things, that was part of the whole thing. And, and all, also to, to, accept foreign troops and on American soil and 
all of these things, but the Boston bombing was part, but the, the real victim right here now is this poor guy who is maybe going to lose his life for something he had absolutely nothing to do with. I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to stop that from happening. But look at Siran Siran, he's, his whole life he's been rotting away. And he's just one of so many that have had to take the fall for these. This awful group, absolutely awful group. And, and also all of these wars that have been based on fake, fake terror. Because I tell you, I specialized in looking into so-called terror attacks. After 30 years, I'm not sure there is such a thing as a real terrorist. Because every single time, it's the same people behind it. It's the same. And the FBI, the CIA, the MI6, the BOSS, the Mossad, the same. it's the same coming up again and again and again, once again. In the States, sponsored, trained, funded by the FBI that are there to protect you. Look at all the, the so-called terror attacks on U.S. soil. They have been there in the background doing exactly the same thing. I think it was George Napolitano who went out big time before he was fired, just saying, listen guys, check it out. And this is exactly what he said. He showed that the FBI was involved in every single one of them. There was just a, a CIA, high-ranking CIA official who came out and said that this week. I, I know, it's nothing. It's just, this is the thing. You know that gets me sometimes. I I have I think the the real truth around the assassination of Olaf Palme. It happened in 1986. I wrote the book. It was ready in 2001. Now to this very day, newspapers are coming forward with like, oh look at this. I came up that I found in 1988. It's in the book. It's been it's out there. Do, do you know what I'm saying? It's like. Right. They, they do not want the real truth out there because they, that is one of the few things they fear is the truth. That is the thing they fear. So let's get it out there, big time. Right. And start thinking about the things that you fell for before. And kind of, this is what I'm doing today. I'm resolving not to fall for it anymore. Sounds wonderful. I mean, I, I lived through the... Uh, the, the moon landing. And, uh, you know, if I would have, could, could have pulled myself away from the society at the time and sat down with myself, uh, free from interference with the media, and said, well, does this make sense? You know, what was it? Uh, six years ago, he said, we're going to go to the moon. I don't think humans are, well, I think there was Sputnik went into outer space. And I don't think it was manned. I think it was just, uh, you know, they threw something high enough to go into outer space. Kennedy resolves to go to the moon. And then all of a sudden, five years later, we're at the moon. I, honestly, during that time, uh, most people that were into advanced mathematics used what they called uh, slide rules. Have you ever seen one of those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's Neanderthal technology to go to move through outer space, to hit a moving object. I mean, I think the, the calculations would have to be, unless they were helped by, uh, you know, an, an outside force, I think it would be almost impossible just logically thinking back in 69. And the same goes with 911. It, it just defies it's logic. But the whole thing is, if you keep repeating the same lie, yes. enough, uh, enough times, people will start believing it. And the bigger the lie, the easier it is to to get people to believe it. Because it's just like, no, come on, you must be joking. Right. Of course it's true. Nobody would come up with a thing like that. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, they just did. <clears throat> right. You know, it, it was funny. We were watching um, Simon Parks. Now, Simon Parks is a guy, he's, he's really fringy. He's a guy who's, uh, he's a public official in England. He's a, a, a councilman. And he claims that he was raised by ETs and stuff. And uh, 
I'm not sure how credible he is, is at all, but he said something very profound on an interview. He said that he was talking about uh, ET disclosures. And he said, the only way you're going to believe it is for somebody in a suit and tie that's got a, some kind of an official designation, like a, a TV commentator or a, a president or a da da da, for them to say it. All the rest of it, can, all the rest of us could say it over and over and over again, and nobody buy it. And that's what's happening with these. Until somebody comes out in an official capacity, and, and, and even there, they're even doing it, uh, and says that all the all the terror acts at the 20th century were false flags. Nobody believes it. You could give them all the. Oh, people are coming forward. <coughs> yes, oh, they are. People are coming forward all the time now, on a weekly basis, almost saying the same thing. You know, the FBI needs the terror to get financed. The CIA is behind. You know, it's like more and more people. The ship is going down. At least the way I see it, the ship is going down, and people are leaving it. You know, the the earlier the better. And I I totally uh, recommend, please step forward, have some kind of courage and step forward, become a whistleblower and, and spread whatever you know to the rest of us so it can, can gain help for humanity. Because we are at a point where it's just a matter of time. It is just a matter of time before this whole thing explodes in, in your own face. It is. It, because, like you said, so much is out there. So suddenly, a major part of the population will say, oh my God, what have we been duped into believing? And there will be like a tipping point where suddenly it just goes, whoa. Right. And I've, I've got uh, on my website, lightonconspiracies.com, i got a beautiful video that you can find on, I think you can find on YouTube as well. It's about, it says how a natural movement is created. Uh, have you seen that? No, I haven't. Oh, it's beautiful. It's uh, somebody is just filming at a rock concert somewhere. You know, there's a little grassy slope and there's people sitting everywhere listening to music. And then one guy stands up and starts dancing. You know, he throws off his shirts and, and shirt and just starts dancing and so on. Not very good at dancing. It looks awful, you know, like a frog in a mixer, that type yeah. of thing. But he enjoys himself. He's totally happy, totally free in himself, and starts dancing. People laugh, point fingers at him, and so on. You, you know, look at the weirdo, look at the crazy guy, like this. Then a second, after a while, a second guy comes up, joins him, the first guy embraces him, welcomes him, and both of them start dancing. Looks awful, but they're really happy and totally free in themselves. Then a third, then a fourth, then a fifth, then a sixth, then a seventh, then an eighth. Suddenly it escalates, you know, and within, I think it's like 35, 40 seconds after the third guy comes along, the whole grassy uh, slope is dancing because suddenly the people that were sitting laughing, pointing finger, they're on the outside. Right. And suddenly the whole thing is just, uh, you know, like, rocking it's it's an absolute party dance party and there's this a voiceover that said this is how it happens it is not the first person like like myself i was one of i see myself as one of the first in the 80s i mean i was totally alone for so many years that is not the most important one it's the second one the follower no not either the third it's the third and the fourth these are the ones that makes the ball roll you know just like like in, a, in an avalanche and with a snowball, these are the ones that makes it. And then that starts not a linear development, but sort of like a totally skyrocketing movement of whatever it is. And I think this is how this awakening is going, going to go on as well, because I don't know about you, but I've seen the last year or so, it's just amazing how people are, are waking up in the thousands compared to before. And I think it's just, you know, every single one that wakes up, it's, it goes out like in rings on water and starts spreading, if, especially if we do it in the right way, in a loving way, in a non-hateful, a non-violent way, but just spread the info, not like black negative information, but 
information spread with the intention of, of lifting this world, exposing what is going on so that we can free ourselves because we're slaves at the moment. People are not, many, most people are not aware of it, but we are, we are slaves big time in, in all the important areas. They have infiltrated on purpose, by design, every single area that really means something. And they got us by the balls there without us knowing it. So I think, once again, I think the feud is going to be absolutely incredible. Because uh, for the first time in a long, long, long series of years, we will be in a point where it's up to us what to do with the world. So the question is, will we be able to lift it to a place that is really, uh, that would make us proud of ourselves? Right. You know, or will we just mess it up just like they did it? When this group, this small little group, I mean, they're, when you look at the, the core group in this, there are only a few thousand. We are billions. We have billions of people on this beautiful earth that have been duped by this small, small little group. But the question is, can, how can we move this world forward? Can we lift it? Can we save nature? Can we get it back in balance? Can we treat each other with, with love and respect and, and dignity the way it's supposed to be? Or will we go lose ourselves in desires and greed and all of these things and just me, me, me and not taking care of each other, which will just go, get us back on the same track that we were before. I said, let's focus on, on creating an absolute stunning world. Stunning world. My, my vision is a world with total ceasefire, total equality for all, you know, where, where there's a, a feeling of, of uh, balance and, and beauty and, and generosity among people, where we, where we look, how can I help you? What can I bring to the table? What can I do for the world? What can I do? And so instead of what can I get, what can I get? You know, I heard that if you take the I plus double L that goes, makes ill, if you take we, plus double L, that means well. If you start thinking of we instead of I, I mean mine, makes a minefield around yourself, you know, that just explodes. And just see what can, what can I do for us? How, what can we do? That is where life also pays you back, multiplied, where you get all of these beautiful things attracted into your life that will lift you and lift the people around you. So... I think that exciting times. I think the dance party is beautiful. I can just picture the whole world erupting yes. into a dance party. We're gonna yes, yes, yes. we're gonna inherit so much technology. We're gonna be so yep. free from uh, these controllers that it's it's gonna probably be wild for a while. But there are a lot of guys like you and Max Egan and uh, David Ike who are definitely pushing for love. Uh, instead of do you, know, do, you, do you know who's going to be in this very house uh, in a week? Who? Max Max Egan, Sam Gardner, myself on the <laughs> in my house. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. You guys have big responsibility. You have to pull the rest of us along. Hey, well, I... you're a heavy heavy bunch. <laughs> <laughs> we are a heavy bunch. <laughs> no, you. You're not. I'm, I was only kidding. It's such a pleasure. I just feel absolutely blessed and and, and uh, honored to be in a position where, I, if I can inspire in any way. But uh, well, you do it every time we have you around. This time, I was so fascinated with the information, <clears throat> and I I want to I want to definitely end on a high note. But before before we start wrapping it up, we have still plenty of time. You were talking about whistle whistleblowers coming forward, and I think that's a big process, and I think that's an important process. And I know that uh, Chip Tatum has come forward with a lot of stuff, and you were able to release a lot of stuff. Do you do you have any advice, or if you were going to coach a whistleblower, what would, how would you say, how would you how would you tell them to start? What, what would you tell them to do to try to keep themselves safe, but also 
get the information out. Do you have any advice like that? I tell you, I asked the exact same question to Chip a while ago. Uh, I had him and, and another war veteran on a police officer, former police officer, uh, who now has a, a radio program, Alan Taylor Shearer. Chip said that at this point, it is shit scary to become a whistleblower. There are no safety, there's no safety net, no security for sure. But it, at the same time, it is at a, at a point in, in the history of the world where, where more and more are just on the edge of, of taking the step. So he said, if possible, get your finances safe, or at least if you're in a possibility to secure your finances, do that before you step forward, because they will try and hit you financially. They will try to, you know, shut down your job or, or push you out outside uh, society and so on. But if you have the, uh, the financial possibility of securing it somehow, perfect. Also, whatever information you want to come forward with, spread it out beforehand so that it's out there in many, many different areas, secured. He, like Chip has a network of people where he has what he calls his, his insurance uh, with... Uh, I think it's eight different locations in the world uh, where this uh, uh, information is stored. And if something happens to him, then it will be released. Uh, it's also that you are a target. Uh, in my case, uh, I did, decided to, to go stealth under the radar for many years. That's why no one had heard it. I'm sure no one of you had heard of me before 2012, December because I kept a very low profile. Uh, then I decided time to, to get all of this load off my shoulders. So I went, I spread the information out there big time so that it was out there. I made like a network of all the people I knew around the, the globe saying, please, within the next hour, I'm going to send out the information, the same information, the book, Kudotan Slow Motion, to all of you. Please download it, save it, to give it to friends, get it, just get it out there so that it cannot be stopped. And uh, I would say the same here, that you are the most vulnerable as long as you, are, you had the in, uh, information on your shoulders alone. If you can spread it out there, it's more secure for you. And then if something should happen to you, it would only am amplify what you were saying. And they, they're very aware, they're very, uh, they try to avoid uh, creating martyrs, they try to uh, avoid publicity and so on. So if you can pump it out there quickly, then it's a lot easier for you to, to take a step forward. Otherwise than that, please contact me. If, if I can help you in any way or form, I'll, I'll be most happy to. I, I don't have a magic wand. I cannot say that this is going to be an easy uh, trip. It is not. But it, this is a time for courage. This is a time for, for bravery, to excel yourself, to stand up. And, and the beauty of standing up in the truth is part of securing you as well. So uh, I can only welcome you and help you if I can. That's, that's really good that's, advice. I think there's a lot of people now are, are feeling guilty because they're involved with it, even if it's tangentially, you know. If you work for the CDC and you know that the, ho the hoax that the vaccine industry is going through, you know a little piece of that, anytime, anything, anything that you can bring forward will help the cause. But be careful, maybe contact Oli first and make sure that you can kind of protect yourself by having the, having the, the information out there like Chip does. I also want to ask you, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, there, there is no real security. But I believe that life uh, rewards bravery. I really think that life rewards uh, uh, courage. When you, when you live as a coward, life is no good. You do not feel good. Very often, they, these emotions can even make you sick and, and, and destroy your family around you because you, there's all this negative energy around you. Truth has this incredible liberating force around it. 
that also when you do something very scary, you feel good about yourself afterwards if you've done it for the right course. And no course could be better than this. Even if you, you uh, this whole setup, this whole global conspiracy is by design made by a totally comp compartmentalization. They, they've done it by design so that every single one of us only know our little tiny little piece of the puzzle. But every single piece is important. So even if it's you think no, but it's uh, is it really worth it? Is it is it of importance? Please bring it forward. Sometimes your part of this jigsaw puzzle can be the one that makes the difference. Absolutely, that's good advice. Also, it's it's it'll it'll allow you to forgive yourself for this, for being involved in this, and allow all of us to forgive you for. Uh, uh, you're part of this. Plus, you'll be harmonizing with natural law, which is something you yeah. definitely want to want to be harmonizing to. I wanted to ask you. Uh, but, uh, go ahead, Ola. No, I would also say I would suggest all of us that we look ourselves in the mirror and we say, "Do I, in any way or form, contribute to the new world order?" You know, if you're working at a bank, if you're working as a tax uh, officer at the IRS, which is totally illegal in the NSA and the FBI and the military force and the police force in the whatever area, then the FEMA camps, there's so many. Are you working as an electrician in the FEMA camps? Are you a plumber in the um, private prison things that have turned into a total, total... Uh, slavery business, you know, all of these things. What is your part? Do you deliver missiles? Are you a risk kid that just came up with a, a bullet that can, you know, follow its uh, victim or what, whatever it is? Ask yourself, am I in any way or form part of this secret agenda? And if so, how can I take a step out? How can I stop it? How can I, you know, like... Uh, I loved it during the Second World War in Denmark, for instance, where <clears throat> uh, you had these big German tanks, the t Tiger tanks and so on. The only thing it took was a spoonful of sh sugar in the tank to totally destroy this whole brutal killing tool, you know. So I said, let's add, I think I've said this before in your show, let's just add a spoonful of sugar into their whole military industrial complex crap machine and let's stop it and then use technology for something that is good for the world that can lift us because just like you said Paul once these this group stops messing the rest of us up there's so many patents and beautiful inventions and free energy devices and so that is just being hidden from us that this whole world can just lift in such a short time you know, I, I spoke to a uh, an expert uh, within uh, national economy and so on, things that I have absolutely no idea about. And <clears throat> we were talking about how long it would take if this group stopped and somebody with the right intention could get the financial balance in the world back in the way it should be when you look upon it with a, a sane mind. And he said it would take 48 hours. Wow. I'm, I'm like, I have no idea. Maybe he was just totally exaggerating, totally off the moon. But if, if, he, if he had said like two years, I would still be over the moon. He said 48 hours. So maybe the real truth is somewhere in between that. You know, but we, we, there's a mind, a mad mindset that has been in control of us for such a long time. So as soon as that stops... It's, it's like if, you have, if you're trying to pump up a, a, a tire and there's a big puncture, the air just keeps going out and you're ex totally exhausted trying to get this rubber boat floating. But as soon as you fix, fix the, the hole, suddenly boom, 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 you don't have to pump anymore. You can feel happy. You can be in the rubber boat and, and join with the rest of us and just float. Exactly. Very nice. Hey Oli, what's going on with uh, with your next step on your project, on your film project? Where do you go from here on that project? I 
I know I kind of made a kind of a right turn here, but uh, I want to make sure that <laughs> that I can follow you and we all know yeah. what's going on with that. Yeah. I tell you, there's so much thing, good things happening in my life this year. Uh, I've uh, been approached by a man who's working for, as my manager for free because I'm just a simple guy. I have no finances backing any of this. I'm, I have no personal gain for doing all of these 30 years. Uh, so I just want to say, I'm saving that any kind of efforts to helping or supporting me is extremely appreciated. Oh, let me, let me. Donations or buying my membership area, newsletter and so on. Let me jump in there for a second. They should go to your website, light on, lightonconspiracy.com. There are a lot of things for sale there. He's a musician. He's got some great music. He's got books. He's got things that you can help help his cause by getting some of this information for your home. So I think that's a, that's an important step. Stop by lightonconspiracy.com. So go ahead, continue. I'm sorry, I wanted to jump in, though. Thank you, Paul. It's actually lightonconspiracies.com oh, because okay, there's sorry. so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I lost the thread now. Well, you were you were talking about the, the person who's going to do some management for you. And oh, you yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, this amazing guy, his name is Richard. He's, uh, he's a step forward. And what he's aiming at is to help me get the word out there. And he's aiming at setting up uh, international tours for me. And because it's so much more powerful, I find, to speak directly to people than through a radio or or TV or something like that. It's much more personal. I, I love going out there. I love, uh, and especially, uh, you know, like meeting people in uniform or police officers or some, and help them to wake up to what's going on and, and become pe people of honor again because they, so many of them have lost the, the, the direction. And I do not blame them at all. But anyway, so I'm very focused on, on making... Uh, international tours. Anyone who would come up with ideas or, or, or would like to help in any way or, or say this is a good place or that or whatever or would help on a local level, if I come there, please contact me, info at lightonconspiracies.com. And uh, also, um, I think I'm, I'm going to go several times to Sweden this summer uh, to do tours around the uh, site of the assassination of the Swedish. Prime Minister of the because that is an absolute mind-blowing conspiracy carried out by the same people that um, are behind so many of the other ones. But what I do is I take uh, people around on tour in groups on the site. It's a four to five hour tour where I just point out exactly this was what happened and people leave there with their flabbergasted, gasted, you know, totally mind-blowing information, I would say. Um, I've also been approached by a, an American filmmaker who, who is interested in, in possibly making a TV series based, uh, like a TV thriller based on the Palmer assassination, the real truth behind it, which is going to be also incredible. So I'm really, really hoping that would go through. We were talking on the break about maybe Luke Rudkowski or somebody from his school uh, joining hands with you. Yep. Yeah. To go and that, go ahead. Yeah, that. No, this is also a dream I had. Is that I would so love to get a, a, a TV crew. I mean, it doesn't have to be you know, very advanced, but uh, somebody with a, a good camera, sound equipment, and so on. And then that this crew and I would go, uh, like, make a series, like a series of documentaries, but on site, so that uh, we would go to many of these different places where they have carried out uh, the false flag operations, where I on site would just debunk the official story, show what actually happened, not the official story, and also by, you know, filming angles and what, whatever, on site it would be very obvious to, for the viewer to see that, oh my God, we've been taken for a big ride here. Right. So, it would be amazing to make a series of, you know, to go 9-11, Boston, many places in Europe where they carried these things out, everything from train bombings to blowing up train stations or 
seven seven, you know, or you know the supermarket shootings, or the also hits on different politicians and beheading in village, and there's so many of them that I think it could be an incredibly interesting documentary. At least I hope so. So if anyone feels that, wow, this could be something for me, or uh, the people that are backing me to do a thing like that, because it needs to be quality as well, not uh, amateur level. It really needs to be professionally presented and, and so on. Uh, please contact me as well, because uh, I think that could be a big step forward when it comes to these things. I think that would be fantastic. It would be like... Uh... Jesse Ventura's project. What was it? Conspiracy theory. Well, yeah, this would be. Go ahead. Conspiracy you... facts and stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This would be the the real deal. Well, yeah, because conspiracy theory, uh, that was uh, conspiracy theories. That was actually a, 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 something that was created just after the JFK assassinations by the same people behind it, so that they could hit any true critic uh, against the, of the official story, they could hit them with this label, conspiracy theorist. Because as soon as you say theory, there's a doubt. Right. It's not conspiracy facts, it's a conspiracy theory, or you're a conspiracy theorist. Then you, people direct you, they see you as a tinfoil hat, somebody up and with their hair, head up in the sky, not understanding anything. But we're talking about conspiracy facts, hard facts, nothing else. Exactly. It would be more like Operation 40 or your Operation 40 group or, or something like that. Anyway, uh, we're coming to the end of our time here. Holy, would you like to say something here, uh, like final comments? I would very much like to end with uh, the prayer I always end with. <coughs> it's, uh, a, I'm not a religious person, but I have this absolutely beautiful Raja Yoga teacher that is yoga for the mind not for the body, but uh, it goes like this. Her name is Nelly Chalaram, and the prayer goes like this. May the entire universe be filled with peace and joy, love and light. May everyone, and especially the ones who hurt us, be filled with peace and joy, love and light. Victory to that light. Because the thing is, we all need to heal. These so-called bad guys need to heal as well. Otherwise, this madness will just continue. We're all in this together, and we need to heal it together as well. That's beautiful, Oli. Thank you very, very much. This has been a fascinating couple hours. It whizzed by for me, and I hope it did for you too. Uh, it's been fun, and we'll do this again. Hope I don't have to go through your manager now, though. Hope I can. Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> okay. Let's do it often. I mean, give us a. Anytime. You see me online, I'm here for you. Okay, great. Thank you, Ollie. Have a great day. Bye bye. Bye bye.